The end of a chapter was near. For the Mongol hordes under Halaku, Lieutenant of Chinggis, were steadily destroying all the civilization of Islam which lay in their inexorable path westwards. Rukhnidin, son of Aladdin, succeeded him and tried first to turn the Mongol tide. After a series of encounters, pitched battles, intrigues, and counter-intrigues, Rukhnidin was taken. He prayed for time as long as he could, but he was eventually murdered in his own turn by the victorious Mongol chief's men. Assassin power in Persia was broken, and what remained of the members were ordered, none knows by whom, to conceal their faith and await a signal that the cult was in full operation again. Alamut was silenced, and the Syrian headquarters alone remained. And if it had not been for the refusal of the Christian kings in Europe to send ambassadors to make a treaty or a new crusade with the Mongol horde, then all of Islam would have been decimated. But it was not. For the Christian kings, even though they would have liked to regain their foothold in the Middle East, had problems of their own and ignored the Mongol emissaries. It was a long time until the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt was able to overcome the Mongol thrust. In 1260, however, he carried the banners of Islam victoriously against them and restored the fortress of Alamut and other properties to the assassins who were strongly surviving underground. They soon found that they had exchanged one master for another. But the Egyptians were now employing them for their own purposes and required them to undergo a new initiation, that of the ancient Egyptian mysteries of Babylon. Ibn Battuta, the great traveler of the 14th century, found them well entrenched in their former strong places, being used as the, quote, arrows of the Sultan of Egypt, with which he reaches his enemies, unquote. The supposed suppression of the creed which followed the Mongol destruction did not, in fact, take place. Copying each other, historians <laughs> have asserted that a fashionism died 600 years ago. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now again, however, fresh facts of their continued existence still come to light. In the 18th century, an Englishman, the British consul at Aleppo in Syria, was at pains to make this better known. He said, quote, some authors assert that these people were entirely extirpated in the 13th century by the Tartars, but I, who have lived so long in this infernal place, will venture to affirm that some of their spawns still exist in the mountains that surround us, for nothing is so cruel, barbarous, and execrable that is not acted and even gloried in by these cursed assassins, unquote. The assassins were widely dispersed throughout Asia. The rise of the thugs, the secret society of assassination of India, followed the Mongol invasion of Persia. Indeed, at least one of the thug recognition signals, Ali Baha'i Salam, indicates salutations to Ali, the descendant of the Prophet most greatly revered by the assassins. Ishmaelis, not all of them recognizing the one chief, reside in places as far apart as Malaya, East Africa, and Salam. They would not necessarily feel that they are assassins in the same sense as the extremists who followed the old sheiks of the mountains, but at least some of them revered the descendants of the lords of Alamut to the extent of deification. The modern phase of Ishmaelism dates from 1810 when the French consul at Aleppo found that the assassins in Persia recognized as their divinely inspired chief a reputed descendant of the fourth grand master of Alamut who then lived at Kek, a small village between Isfahan and Tehran. This Shah, Khalilullah, quote, was revered almost like a god and credited with the power of working miracles. The followers of Khalilullah would, when he pared his nails, fight for the clippings. The water in which he washed became holy water. The sect next appeared to the public gaze through an odd happening. In 1866, a law case was decided in Bombay. There is in that city a large community of commercial men known as Tohas. A Persian, the record tells us, Aga Khan, Mehalati, a native of Mehalat, a place situate near Kek, had sent an agent to Bombay to claim from the Kojas the annual tribute due from them to him and amounting to about 10,000 English pounds. The claim was resisted, and the British court was appealed to by Aga Khan. 
Sir Joseph Arnold investigated his claim. The Aga proved his pedigree, showing that he had descended in a direct line from the fourth Grand Master of Alamut, and Sir Joseph declared it proved. And it was further demonstrated by the trial that the Kohas were members of the ancient sect of the Assassins, to which sect they had been converted 400 years before by an Ishmaelite missionary who composed a work which has remained the sacred book of the Kohas. In the first Afghan war, the then Aga Khan contributed a force of light cavalry to the British forces. For this, he was awarded a pension. Iffy, in his History of the Arabs, notes, page 448 in 1951 edition, that the assassin sect known as Kohas and Mawas gave over a tenth of their revenues to the Aga Khan, who spends most of his time as a sportsman between Paris and London. The influence of the new form of organization and training, as well as initiatory techniques of the assassins upon later societies, has been remarked by a number of students, and I have found in my research that it's absolutely true, that the Crusaders knew a good deal about the Ishmaelis as shown from the detailed descriptions of them which survive. Esh Amir Ali, an Orientalist of considerable repute, goes further in his assessment. Quote, from the Ishmaelis, the Crusaders borrowed the conception which led to the formation of all the secret societies, religious and secular, of Europe. The institutions of Templars and hospitality, the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola, composed by a body of men whose devotion to their cause can hardly be surpassed in our time. The ferocious Dominicans, the milder Franciscans, may all be traced either to Cairo or to Alamut. The Knights Templar, especially with their system of Grand Masters, Grand Priors, and religious devotees, and their degrees of initiation, bear the strongest analogy to the Eastern Ishmaelis.